Welcome, adventurers, to Probability of Demise, the podcast where critical fumbles meet critical face palms. Join us as we delve into the darkest dungeons, slay the stupidest gremlins, and roll enough ones to make a beholder weep. Forget epic storylines and heroic deeds. Here we celebrate the chaotic beauty of bad roles, questionable decisions, and characters with more charisma than sense. We'll be your dungeon masters of disappointment, guiding you through campaigns where the only guaranteed treasure is a mountain of laughter and maybe some psychic scarring. So grab your Nat One dice, strap on your anxiety helmets, and prepare to witness the glorious train wreck that is our D&D journey. Because, in the end, even if your character dies face first into a pile of pudding, at least you'll have the dice god's permission to laugh your ass off. familiar chime of the doorbell at Cecilia's seaside sundries and of S's rings one last time as our group assembles. The salty sea breeze drifts through the open windows, carrying with it the echoes of countless battles, alliances, and mysteries investigated. Welcome, dear friends. Tonight marks not an ending, but a celebration, and it's a moment to honor the epic tale we've woven together over 38 sessions, countless dice rolls, and shared memories. Here we are, surrounded by Celia's curious collection of seashells and sundries. <laughs> See, I did know what it was. Where our story first began. Tonight, we'll unravel the intricate threads of our campaign from those first tentative steps into investigating the high magic city of Overton to our climactic finale. The beginning. <laughs> Chronicle the evolution of our heroes, their triumphs, their sacrifices, and the moments that transformed them. Share the untold tale tales, the near misses, and the happy accidents that have shaped our narrative. I'll also invite everyone to peek behind the DM screen to understand the gears and levers that drove our story forward. Speculate on the futures of our characters and the world they've left their mark upon. And most important, celebrate the real magic, the friendships we forge as a pod, and hopefully your own pods. The artifacts of our adventure surround us, dog-eared character sheets, battle-worn dice, and maps marked with the footprints of destiny. Each item tells a story, each memory builds upon the last, creating something greater than the sum of its parts. So raise your mugs, investigators, whether you've wielded cunning words or rainbow spells, played tinkerer or investigator, your contribution to this tale has been invaluable. The candles flicker, the dice await their final roll, and the story of probability of demise. <laughs> prepares to reveal its deepest secrets. Hey, Rick, what's the name of the podcast again? Of the Word of the day. That's me. It's the very last one of me, too, Uh, for a bit. Uh, <laughs> so welcome once again, fellow D and Deers. What, what, how do you pluralize? Players? Anyways. Dungeon Delvers. <laughs> Dungeon Dwellers. Wow, none of us can talk today. Um. Well, two are down. Two, two left to go. We'll see how the other two fare. <laughs> so today's word, uh, I'm not going to lie with you folks. I tried to be really fancy. I tried to find a really fancy word that meant like, coming to an end, a conclusion, but like a word we don't know. Come find one. So if you know a really fancy word that revolves around ending, comment and let me know because I couldn't find anything myself. Decapitation. No. <laughs> oh. So today's word is... Mm -mm. jocular it is oh also i forgot tis my nature once again ba -ba -ba. d100 because i already rolled so i forgot <laughs> and today's number and you just told us that you were cheating the system by trying to find a different word 
<laughs> that is true. I did like cheat and wanted to like. This week's role was meaningless. It was. This week's is. role was going to be meaningless, but turned out not to be. Since I can't find a word. <laughs> Today's number was 52, which now we all know was I just randomly rolled so that I had a number. But I did roll. Uh, and the word was jocular, like I said. Which means, um, loading, loading, rawhide. It does not mean rawhide. No. Well, you could ah. be a jocular rawhider. So jocular means humorous or playful. Uh, and used in a sentence, our very last sentence. The jocular halfling kept the party spirits high with his clever jokes, even in the midst of their most dangerous quest yet. Voila. Tis the last word of the day. For now. For now. I love how she keeps saying it's the last word of the day, and I'm kind of like, are you sure? Well, next, next time, folks, we should have a new... A new... A new thing i don't know what a but new thing mm. a new segment mm. fans let us know what the new segment should be i think it should be jason teaching us a new dance move every week <laughs> nobody wants <laughs> like, to see that i've only got one <laughs> dance. <laughs> this is the mashed potato and this is how you do it and then jason must Please uh, like, demonstrate comment, subscribe <laughs> and in your comment i would like a list of dance moves and which one of our fabulous cast members should have to do the dance move? It's going to say Jason every time if we do that. Nobody... <laughs> Jason, Only Jason, one of us is Jason, a professional Jason, dancer, Jason. so we know who's not being selected. <laughs> Get the pro over there. If it's churn the butter, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> we should just all do our most terrible ones. Well, anyways, welcome. We're going to go ahead and jump into the campaign. Uh, you all know what we've been up to. We started off as we ended, quite Dead. literally. Oh, no. So, I don't know. Does anybody have any thoughts about the plot and what occurred? The, any thoughts about what the plot and what, sorry? The plot in general, the, the main plot, like this whole story that we went through. We went through this storyline where... Um, and it, it, it initially, it, it, I intended this to be like lots of individual um, cases, sleuthing situations. But y'all are very fun to follow character-wise, <laughs> and then you and end up can't make a decision as a group. Well, and you know, stories happen, so <laughs> it is fun. But I, I, we, we, we have not lent ourselves towards an episodic nature. I think the first session, it took us most of the session just to Beat. get everybody together, and that was yeah. a little bit my fault. And then second session, just we just wanted to give the world an theater. example of why you why so many campaigns start with. So you find yourself in a tavern <laughs> because oh, then yeah. you're all in the fucking tavern, and you just have to meet instead of being on three different parts of a city. <laughs> mm. And having to find That's reasons true. to push us together. Good times. I got to do it twice, though. Yeah, sticky beak. Yeah, you did. <laughs> um. So any. Oh, speaking of sticky beak, I don't think I have it near me right now. Um. But somebody in my local area who watches our podcast found me a sticky beak mask at Spirit Halloween of all places. Oh. <laughs> And gave it to me like a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. That's so and I was sweet. trying to find a reason to wear it, and I kept forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> so somewhere in here, there's a sticky beak mask. Do you need a nostalgia minute for this campaign? Do you need a minute? Do you want to go find it? No. <laughs> no. I don't want to look for anything right now. Okay. Um. All right. Well, so like the overall plot was. Discover who killed Grant. Mm -hmm. um, Which I feel like we lost sometimes. We literally lost the plot. 
but that <laughs> that's not you that's us um hyper fixating on little things yeah it's also super fun to follow where you're all going because sometimes what you're doing is just very entertaining and for me i really enjoyed exploring the city with your eyeballs mm. Mm. like you all got me to places in the city that i hadn't really thought about that deeply i just kind of had some quick <laughs> notes and then you went to them and i was like oh mm. well where would they go if they did that and Unfortunately, like following you're the, the only one who could remember the together, neighborhood names <laughs> i had neighborhood names but i didn't have like a lot of details on each of them i just had kind of a brief yeah. like i don't know it's kind of one of those crazy things where you're just like, oh yeah they're gonna go there so i'm gonna write this up before the next session because i don't know what's there you know i will say that there's only really one place that i could have used just a little bit less thought into the bone the part. bone place what's his face is uh, office? no not Wait, no not even no the not, magic shop. Not, office was awesome no the magic shop the magic shop really got oh. to you like, they were making it up on the spot too. I bet. Just like, ooh, what else can I add? Ooh, ooh, oh else? no, because they had it. They, they had, had visualizations the all thing. ready to go. Oh, that that is no, true. no, no, that that that. Like the stool made of yeah. legs. And the... That is true. God, That's one like... of those situations where, as a DM, you become really, um, like I didn't have the smithy, the bakery that also had the library or the magic shop thought out. And then when I knew that's what you're going to be doing, you're going to be engaging with those things. I spent that week writing them up and coming up with ideas. And then I got stuck, like obsessed with this whole body horror pun based magic shop. And I just couldn't let it go. Like I had fun with the bakery, with the, with, with the yeah. book. Like I, I think that was inspired by all the TikToks where they were talking about the plant people who talk about nurseries as the plant shelter. Oh, go yeah, adopt yeah, plants. yeah. I was thinking, what would be like the book version of that? What's the person who like obsessively collects and takes care of books, but not in a library way where it's shared, but more of like a, I'm protecting them. This is the shelter for the books. <laughs> the that was a really good. Someday. The that book was rescue. Really... <laughs> the book rescue. <laughs> That was a really good concept. I really enjoyed that that NPC and that uh, that little story moment. I think I think in terms of like the and overall stupid son. <laughs> he w I rolled an intelligence stat for that character because I thought you might fight him and her. They could have been antagonists. So, <laughs> I have never rolled so bad on stats. <laughs> he was crap. Like not even like. A bad roll. Oh, I can re-roll this because I rolled so horribly. It's just like, I think it was the first time I did. I, I did like a six, six, seven, eight, ten, something. It was like all super low. So then I re-rolled it again, and I still got. I think the highest stat I had for him was a twelve. Yeah. I was like, oh well, he's doomed. Sorry, the rest of you were saying something and I just talked over you. My bad. ADHD. Um, Wee. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just I was saying that I think um in terms of like the overall plot, uh one thing that you do really well, Rurik, is uh outside of the actual session. Like you remind us, like, okay, well, <laughs> These are the things you have going on. <laughs> you kind of keep us in check um, the best that you can. And Don't so forget you locked that guy in a closet seven sessions ago. <laughs> He's probably dead now. Yeah. So um, so thank you for that, like extra mental effort that goes into that. I think that, you know, that's not something that our viewers and listeners would necessarily know. Um like beyond the preparation there's also like a like a a debrief that has to happen for our own sakes and uh i think something that I'm jason so for would... my sake sometimes yeah, because yeah. 
there, there were a couple of times in this campaign, especially, I don't think it was as strong as in the last campaign. There were a couple of times where you all came in and you'd totally forgotten things that you had been big ahas in the last session. And I was sitting there <laughs> going like, oh, uh-oh. They, uh-oh. And that's <laughs> the reality of playing once a week and then sometimes having to take longer breaks and then playing like a, a slew of sessions back to back and then taking a couple breaks. That's just the reality of how it works. And I also think that because we play this way, like in our brains, like if, if we were playing in person and not having to worry about technology or anything along those lines, or like the, you know, the, the audience factor, we would have a lot more like brain percentage to donate towards remembering things like this and like writing, writing shit down. Um, but, uh, we do the best we can. Also, I think Thanks, I would. So, <laughs> I think something that Jason wouldn't mind me sharing, just because it is funny, is that uh, as the person who has been editing the videos for the last, uh, I would say, what four or five months. Huge shout out to Jason for doing that um, and being amazing about it. Um, is that he then? sees all the things that we forgot but it's too late to we've already like played the next session so it's too late to recall those things and be like oh yeah by the way do you remember that we did this so yeah we usually have uh, about three in the bank so i'm finding out things and we're already a month <laughs> on from there it's like a whole rediscovery i've been really enjoying some of some of jason's messages to me at the end or of his <laughs> editing mode he's like what about this whatever happened to that i'm like i don't know y'all forgot to do it so yes. yeah yeah but that's true in in D, D. that's one of the fun things about this you like to pivot to whatever is most interesting to you it can be shiny object syndrome and it's okay <laughs> speaking of the shiny object syndrome is there any other uh primary things around the main plot or are we ready to pivot to the shiny object called your characters. Eight months. I, it's I been guess eight I months since we came. Eight months. Yeah. So I guess I have a question for you, if you don't mind. I guess I'm at you. I see this is later on the on the thing, but I, it, it pertains to this. When you set up certain things, how far in advance do you set them up for like them to? kind of happened like the the floating island coming towards like the the the, the other floating island how far yeah. in advance did you set that up to be integrated into the story i had the floating island i did not have it populated i just had it as a looming threat because i was trying to figure out like I, actually, initially, I threw it in. It was it was color. It, this is supposed to be this high magic society, and there's these floating citadels, but like, there hadn't been another bigger city visiting. And if this is like this high magic society with floating cities around the rest of the world, probably one of those floating cities should come to this huge magical city of Underton and Overton and conduct trade. So initially it was just going to be color. I was going to have it kind of float through some big holiday festival or something like that. I thought there might be a nice break, but as the campaign became more intense and I was looking for ways to um, both give you a high level threat that's really beyond your character's abilities, which is what I tried to do. I needed to provide something that could temper that, that could create spaces so you could actually survive those engagements mm. to give this this is a high magic society. These are, you know, people schlepping through their lives. You know, it's the average person in New York City trying to make it through working two jobs. Um, the world is happening around them. But then they get wrapped up in something. They're, they've been somehow dragged into a police investigation as a eyewitness or whatnot. What does that feel like and look like? But also, how do you make it possible for them to survive it? Because... Mm. I didn't want you all to be, this was a personal choice that might not be something you all liked. 
but I didn't want it to be a situation where you had to be level 20 in order to survive the city. Well, I think it was an interesting juxtaposition of like our last character where two of our two of the three of us ascended to godhood. Like <laughs> I think um <clears throat> like I think this came up a little bit a couple episodes ago, but just about how we were always dealing with things that were like above our pay grade. It was just like these regular people just like trying to solve problems that were so far above them. It would be like the three of us getting together and be like, we're going to solve the Donald Trump problem. Like it's, you know, like, <laughs> like we're going to find the next candidate that can like fucking get in there and fix all of this. Like that's, we don't know how to do that. We're just regular people. And like, that's the kind of crap that gets like thrown in the laps of these three characters. <laughs> and, like, I don't think we've been actually so outrightly political in a bit. Honestly, I think a, bit, yeah. a little bit of the world we do uh, allude to that a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, y'all, if you're listening to us and you don't know our viewpoints by now, you haven't been paying attention. If you haven't figured but... it out, Homelander is not the good guy and you're an <laughs> asshole. Yes. 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 Yep. All right. Moving on. <laughs> so with that answer, let's yeah. jump into the characters. Wait, wait I have one. Oh. I have one little Jess. thing. I just I found it really interesting as a player to realize uh, how much of a weakness murder, like not murder mysteries. Well, I guess this is a murder mystery. How like it's interesting, like how some campaigns you'll feel like it's right up your alley everything makes sense and you know exactly what to do and then i get into a storyline like this and i'm like i am confused i am lost i don't know what's happening <laughs> and it was interesting to be the player to be like i gotta do something or i guess i won't which i have done a few times in a few episodes where i was like i just stand there and wait because i don't know <laughs> Well, speaking of that, how did that influence how your character evolved and grew and the relationships they had? Um, for me like and Serafina, Serafina, when we first saw her, was this excited creator of things who had lost her sister, her brother, and her mm -hmm. father was extremely dangerously ill. Yeah. Uh, and I always thought of her as uh definitely like putting it in more real life terms but like definitely somewhere on the spectrum you know very much like this one hyper fixation she's so smart she's so good at it everything makes sense and then everything else sort of doesn't make sense so when i didn't know what to do in my head i was like well it kind of makes sense for her because also she always had her brother so Whenever she didn't know what to do, she would just be like, uh, what am I doing? And wait to be told, oh, go look at that. Go do this. Go whatever. She was like the little, you know, little thing that, that ran yeah. behind him. I mean, that, that type of paralysis is actually really real for, for neurodivergence. So the kind of like the, the freeze where you're just like, I don't know what to do next. Like, uh, this is completely out of my comfort zone. Um, or even so just I like, think... oh no, I need to make dinner and I also need to do laundry and I have homework for a class and I have this thing for work. And then you sit on the couch and watch seven hours of TV because you can't make a decision about what to do next. Mm -hmm. But um, not translate that into D&D &D world. You know, it's like, well, I have to solve this murder and I have to, <laughs> but I also I need to finish this invention parents, and I have to figure yeah. out what happened to my brother and my dad is really sick. Yeah. So I'm just going to stand here on the stairs. Like, yeah. I honestly kind of loved how it played out in a lot of ways because it's when I looked at what you wrote for your character, um, you had written that Thorin, which was your father's name originally. I don't know if we changed it later on, but um, I don't know. <laughs> your he kind of had a magical version of multiple sclerosis, is what the mm -hmm. concept was, and unaware of the nature of the disease, the struggle for that, plus with your sister's death, kind of initially creating this pall over the family and then your missing brother location situation unknown um and then being at the hospital and trying to commute there every day like it was a lot of messiness and it gave me a lot of space to think about okay 
you are trying to escape from this really intense space. You're trying to find your brother, maybe because he can be the solution to everything. Your mom is, I think you wrote that she was a dedicated worker and I took that as mm -hmm. workaholic. She's trying to mm -hmm. bring in the money to pay for all the situation that's happening. Yeah. And your brother owned this detective agency, which you were like trying to keep propped up, but you just like, it was a great thing. Like the tiefling with six horns can only balance so many things yeah and you can only stick six things on those horns and there was just too many things to stick on the horns so exactly. I really like that. yeah and then over the course of the campaign you started to have a love interest yeah that was wild because i definitely i wasn't sure if seraphina would even have the capacity to find other people attractive let alone find someone who she found attractive and then in her own weird way would slowly started to flirt in a terrible way to then <laughs> get a kiss <laughs> so uh i mean like i I've always been very, very, like, to reference Critical Role, very much like uh, Travis on, on the, like, I'm never gonna romance because that just feels like, uh, how do you, how do you make that, how do you make that happen? And the answer is you don't. Mm -hmm. The answer is, is, is somehow it, it evolves out of itself, like, like step by step like you kind of initiated with like the the pretty lady comments and everything and then at at that point which i want everybody who's listening to this podcast and watching this ask consent uh, i mm -hmm. messaged jess and i said hey would it be okay if like i tried you know if ulua tried to romance your character so after that point it was like okay i'm gonna i'm gonna relax into this a little bit and like actually try to flirt which uh heavily out of practice <laughs> <laughs> i mean what um, i've learned is that asher and tans and i were together and alua and seraphina were together so now we're all married i think is how this turns yes. out yes yes that's that's our multi-generational polycule um <laughs> <laughs> which is so crazy because i always go in being like no love interests, and yet I always end up with one. <laughs> well, always. yeah. I mean, my one fear is that one of you is going to start romancing one of the NPCs, and I won't remember that, like, because that's just not my brain space to think through it. I'm like, oh, flirting. How does that work again? I mean, that's how I felt about Googling it. Googling <laughs> how to flirt. <laughs> um, I mean, Honestly, it could be one of those moments where I don't know if you've ever seen the outtakes from, uh, I don't know if it's Anchorman or Anchorman 2, uh, but it's uh, Kirsten Wig and, oh, what's his name? From The Office. Steve Carell? Yeah, yeah. Steve Carell. Like, their two flirting is like, I mean, it's just comedy gold. But for some people, like, that's what it is it's just like taking a genuine interest in what the other person has to say or like not even caring what they say just being enamored with them so anyways um to come to the pants party speaking of yes. <laughs> flirting and transitioning over to alua for a second alua had a intense backstory that you shared with me and we really barely dipped a pinky toe in it if you compare to like seraphina's backstory we kind of got there we kind of got into everything at, at some point but alua had this really tragic past we had this whole concept of the calm share thing that we didn't really talk in depth but we just kind of like marinated at the top of it yeah there was hints to what it was about but i kind of liked that we never really discussed that but would you like to talk about her history and what made her her sure um i you know and you never know this could be something that could be used in in other ways uh you have my full permission 
Uh, I can also share it with Jason if it's something he ever wanted. If he decides to DM, it's you know. Or, or if I ever write lore about one of our campaigns, like I keep saying, I'm going to do it. That too. Um. So, something that you know is is more unique about the world of Overton now is the how the you know the races or the different varieties of humanoids uh that emerged after this climate crisis um is that they started to intermingle even more and so and there were other nomadic people which if you ever are interested about it you can go to uh there is a website that has all of that lore that rurik may or may not have filled out that should get listed on our website website, I think, for for the people to read, for people who are really interested. Um, I'll have to turn it bookmarked. on. <laughs> um, so the the main thing is is I it was two types of people, one focused in the sand and one focused in the water, and so Alua was born of a tryst between the two, which is why. <laughs> I mean, she just didn't fit in between either people. And so at a very young age, she was sold off to a traveling merchant um, to be uh, an assistant. And she, he, he, you know, had musical instruments and such. And so she started singing and that was how he, you know, found she had this beautiful voice. Um, he wasn't particularly a good person. Um, and she was and I, I didn't necessarily include this in the backstory but I, I i kind of hoped that it was maybe implied she was taken advantage of as a child but as she got to a certain age and he no longer found a use for her uh he sold her into a comb share house and that is where she was able to take her voice and really make that what she was loved and adored for and so it took her a very long time to develop a sense of self that wasn't uh dependent on what people wanted from her or what people were planning on taking from her and so the i felt it was really important for her to own being a comb share and why that's why oksana was so important because oksana really changed the game um and turned being a comb share into something that was respected and revered and took in people who who otherwise at the end of their usefulness would have been discarded in society so that yeah, uh, it, was a, it was a very yeah. interesting backstory to get to play with and, and tinker with so um, yeah you never know we could dig into it another another time someday you never yeah. know yeah i mean like the origin story of alua <laughs> um, yeah it was super interesting and then over the course of the campaign she was kind of forced out of her space as a comb share and other things by the needs of the group mm -hmm. um and uh, which is a thing that i do as a player I tend to be very, whatever we need to do, whatever, whatever, whatever y'all want to do. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> I, have a, I thought I have it was a... very interesting as that went on. And then the romance blossomed with Serafina, but also just navigating the place. What, what is Alua's place? Um, and it was super interesting to have two super high, um, charisma characters in the same, <laughs> same campaign because there were times where you were both like shoving each other out of the way <laughs> both metaphorically and maybe really um but there was interesting spaces because both of you had super high charisma and could probably get away with anything you ever wanted to if you could talk your way around it uh, which was That's super true. fun and checking. a little frustrating you weren't intelligent enough <laughs> to pick up on things. Occasionally I was laughing because I was like, well, we did say this was going to be a mystery campaign, but why did everybody use intelligence as their dump stat except for Serafina? 
It did make. I him feel. Good. I but, think I focused on wisdom next. That might be yeah. why. That was like. I think that fitted. Fitted. That fit. Uh, Ulua's like figuring out people as a comp share and other things. That that made sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, probably a mistake. I didn't think about just because I think intelligence is a common dump step for warlocks, and it's just. I didn't think yeah. about like investigation roles requiring good intelligence. Well, it was my favorite mistake for this campaign to have. And the, even better, the people who constantly investigated it weren't the people who should be doing <laughs> the investigations. It's like, cool. This is going to make it really muddy. I mean, that's, I think that's something that a lot of people also, even though we did it unintentionally, um, shy away from and like when building out a character like they lean they they shy away from putting a needed stat i i think let me rephrase this i think the temptation to min max uh characters is really strong um especially for people who are just starting out and so i want to assure people that if you're building a character it doesn't have to be your first one you know i i will be the first to admit that my very first character was a fucking badass uh mm. i i'm was. i min i min maxed her in a way that i liked not in a way that felt like i'm winning dnd because you're not supposed to win dnd that's not how that works but i felt like she she was really good at the things I wanted her to be good at. But she also had a strength of eight. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. she didn't always, she couldn't always do the things I wanted her to do. But, but she um, occasionally rolled some good rolls on that. And even then you're like, dang it. I know, I know. Um, my, first, my first character was like that too, except for his nine strength. But he was like maxed yeah. out in a bunch of other ways. And so as I've, played more and especially with Rick, I think you you do an amazing job of encouraging people to lean into what could essentially fo like be a character flaw but is completely as a result of like a really crappy role when you're building out a character um, and I think taking that risk makes the story a lot more interesting and the sessions a lot more fun and memorable memorable um, because you could just be like, you know what? Fuck it. I, I, I really like if this, in this ideal situation, I would be able to shoot this arrow, you know, 20 yards as it stands. I can barely shoot at five. I got to figure out <laughs> something else, you know, and it, and it forces you to be creative. So, um, if I could, I, I know you, you know, it was a mis mistake per se that we didn't really pick a lot of intelligence uh, or pick high intelligence, but I think it definitely made for a fun. lot more moments where we were like, well, like when I chose to knock when we were trying to sneak around. That was so <laughs> awesome. That was when, because I that feel like was a Larissa lot of times, failing an intelligence role. <laughs> I feel like a lot of times we start getting angry with each other for making dumb mistakes. And then, like, I think at that point, there'd been a, like Serafina had felt. Like she would had make a lot of mistakes and she was feeling angry at herself. Jason had done the same thing. And then you did it. It was like, we have completed the trifecta. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> we have all been idiots. <laughs> yep. Um, and speaking of Gus having the, that moment, Hello. um Gus had a whole uh fun backstory as well that we didn't go into at all except for his wife. Mm -hmm. um, so just so you all know, Gus is the son of a traitor in the Underdark. Ooh. And there is a key feature of what Gus's trajectory was pre-campaign that I was getting so ready to launch into when Alua had her whip. But we never got there. And I... Do you mind, do tell, Jason, if do I share tell. this one? This is the moment to tell us. Okay. <laughs> no more secrets. So <laughs> Gus's, Jason's character, Gus, gained his accolades early on with the watch for bringing down a radical sect of Tanzanite death cult assassins. 
the whip that's, you had. That's the, the first big case he broke. Yeah. The whip you had is the missing murder weapon from that assassin cult. Oh. <laughs> so the Tanzanian Terror, this assassin organization, you have in your possession that whip. And if you had leveled up the religion aspect just a little bit more before we reset, it was going to be a whole thing. <laughs> I was kind of excited. Also, I love the un the undone things in a campaign and story. See, see my because... intention for that cult was actually um, to play on that Tanzanite accidentally created a, a species of people at the end of campaign one on accident. And that was my thought is like that some like sect of those people had split off and become a cult. <laughs> And I was using it for dirty deeds. Were they um, done dirt cheap? No, nope, sorry. Yeah. There are also some really good jokes that um, Jason had built into this character's background. We never accessed those. I wasn't really sure how to bring up the politician Magic Mike. I really wanted to the whole time. We, we, no, we did, did Ma Magic we, Mike was a serial killer. We did that. That was it. We did do Magic Mike. We didn't do the politician. Because um, then the we were talking about, was it his granddaughter? Yeah, that's one that we left hanging. That, yeah. 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 So it, there's a for, lot of fun in that. There was something you were about to say about um uh Ah uh, No. Things left undone. Yeah, things left undone in It's fun. Like just these oh, un, okay. these oh. unresolved threads are super fun to deal with. They just make life happy. Um, and I also, I, I kept forgetting when we were getting into members of the watch, Dick Brady was the person who is planting evidence and I could never here, hold it in my head. It was, uh, so Dick as in like detective and then Brady is apparently like police slang for somebody that like stabs you in the back or like a traitor. Ooh. So Dick Brady. It was a really cool one. Yeah, um, his whole thing was like he planted evidence. Gus saw him do it. Gus reported him. Gus was like asked to resign, and the guy got away with it. That was like it, I don't know if that ever actually came out, but that's how Gus left the watch. Whoa. Like, wow. Yeah, I don't think we ever really got into it. I definitely think that there was some. Speaking hints. of getting political on our podcast, <laughs> police corruption. That was my. It was super fun. Well, that's right. I'm saying like all sorts of things were happening, but um, I really love that. And then throughout the campaign, Gus, it felt like Gus came into the campaign done with it all. But over the course mm -hmm. of the various pieces, it's like Gus was coming back to life. Yeah. Yeah, he was basically just like waiting to die. That's all he was doing. He's just like b passing time with painting and like pissing around. Having a few drinks at the bar, painting more. He was just waiting, like, every day was the same. Get up, go. Like, just waiting to not wake up one day. That's basically, like, where his mindset was when the campaign mm -hmm. started. Like, he had a good life. He was just done. He was just ready for it to be done. He didn't have anything else. So. It's an interesting. I think all of us did a lot more, like, Role playing in campaign two than we did in campaign one, like emotional role playing, like getting invested in like getting into the head of your character. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I know I was like when the first time that the first time Gus saw his dead wife, like, it was less impactful the second time because it just happened like three weeks ago. <laughs> but the first time, uh, like I was almost in tears by the end of it. Like because I was like trying to just put myself in his place where like this woman that he was like spent his entire life with that he hadn't seen in decades you know like was here she was and like he was in the afterlife and he wanted to stay but he had these responsibilities and like so i like really tried to put myself in that space and i think that's the most i've ever like acted out a character so that was like a new experience for me like can we talk can we talk asher was just a, a big a asher more? was just a big old smart ass like yeah i didn't like, asher was you asher was me yeah exactly he was <laughs> Like maybe and we that's can why talk Jess loved that. it so much. Mm. <laughs> wink. Yeah. Exaggerated like, wink. 
Jess and Larissa, do you have any questions about that bit of I mean, I, Gus history? Well, and also I mean, just the way it felt. So, I think I always enjoy watching other characters get into it. Um, I never know when it's going to happen to me. It just kind of happens. So I'm kind of curious to to pick everybody, including Rurik's brain, on in those moments where things are emotional or should be emotional. What what kind of flips in your brain? Or at least, okay. So let me say what it is for me, and then maybe y'all can say how it feel how it felt to you because I know everybody's brains work differently. Um, uh, I think the moment that flipped hard for me that I wasn't expecting was telling Tanzanite like to pass on a message <laughs> to Oksana and uh, Rodex. I didn't expect that to actually make me tear up. And all of a sudden I was just like, it's like, oh, okay, well, okay, we're feeling this. <laughs> um, so I'd be curious. I don't know, Rurik, as as D as GM, do you think that those moments happen to you too, or do you find that that happens less often if you're not coming from one character's perspective all the time? I think when I really get excited about an NPC that comes through. I think one of the things that I've been doing to protect myself with the NPCs that I've been using is none of them are ones that I care that much about. Mm -hmm. um, there's been so many campaigns that I've run where people just killed my favorite NPCs left and right that I try yeah. not to get emotionally invested. We're fortunately not very murder hobo -y, so. Yeah. So it, it's been starting to peak out Sir Gregor is one. Okay. If you had all chosen to help Sir Gregor, it would have been a big deal. And when I rolled without anybody around, it was all by myself. When I rolled his death, I fell apart. Aww. Um, and you know, I rolled that. I realized what that would mean for the city and kind of the deterioration of the situation. I kind of just took a couple of hours break <laughs> before I got back to it. And that was a really long night of planning. Aww. Rolled up a little wish spell, put it in a ball, tossed it into the world. Yep, pretty much. Oh, the guy's like, <laughs> got to get this out of here. Got to get this done. Um. Some characters I've hated, like, because I inhabit your antagonists a lot. Watching you kill somebody I hate, because I put my least favorite aspects into some of the characters. And it hasn't happened in this campaign as much, but in the last campaign, there were a lot of those characters I really hated. Um, that weren't you know, dragons? The... <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> There was a bunch of them. Before we get away from uh, this, just the uh, yes. the moment that you did that really got me was when we were in like the Whispernet bar and we found out about your brother and then you like stormed over to the guy and like demanded that he had to be wrong. And I felt like you were really, really feeling that because I felt it like from you. Like it like made me choke up like the way that you played that. I thought that was, I don't know. I, I think we all had those moments like in this campaign that we maybe didn't have in the last one. I'm just curious how you felt about it. Yeah. Uh, that's definitely one of the moments I felt it. Um, I mean, coming from like a performer side, I know we're all performers, the four of us, but for those who may be listening and watching who are not, so often as an actor you a part of you is in these characters um, and 
you know, sometimes you can't tell if it's character side of you that's starting to like feel these things or if it's you feeling those things. But just like all of a sudden I was like, you have to be shitting me that he's dead. I was like, all of this shit has happened to her and this family. It's it's just not it's not happening. It's not that's not an option. <laughs> <laughs> But, like, also, you know, so, you know, it. I sometimes found myself wanting to back off of that because I was like, oh, am, am I mad or is she mad? Or is both of us mad? So. So, yeah. I mean, I think, I think the answer is to, to that question is yes. And I think that's, that's. Yeah. I like to. From an acting perspective, that you you have to feel it. Um, you don't have to be it. Like I, like I, I don't know that I, in like method acting versus not. You know, I don't think you have to be a character twenty four seven in order to fully understand a character. But I yeah. do think you have to be able to feel what it is they're supposed to be feeling in that moment. Um and so that's why I think it's really important when those moments to come up to run with them. Um and to just say okay and like that's it's a big yes and in that moment. Um and it and it worked out beautifully because one of the five stages of grief is denial, you know? And so, and another one is anger. And so it was like, it was a completely natural reaction. And that's why I think it worked so well. Um, and then it also gave us a moment to react to how we would support through someone, support someone going through that moment. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's something that I really just to kind of wrap up on this particular topic is I really appreciate about, about each and every one of you is that we are not afraid to be vulnerable with each other. We're not trying yeah. to win this game. Like we're here to play these characters in a way that, can make authentic connections and authentic stories, you know, kind of evolve out of unexpected, you know, or unknown circumstances. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. I feel like I'm rambling. You are, but it's good, good rambles. Oh, no. I talk too much. Speaking of all this, there was this huge reset for all of your characters. But one of the things that I said to you all is keep your stats. What I want to know is do we keep our stuff? Like, do I, do I just wake up on that bar stool with a bag of holding on my hip? Like, that's what I want to talk size? about. What do you think happened? Do you think? Because I had been thinking about it going back and forth, and I was honestly thinking, yeah. I think, they yes, we would still, still have, have all this stuff. All. Because but, they're all things that would have, could have been attained, whether the slotty had come or not. Not whether yours. We, not, not, your, yeah. not the thing that turned you. Oh, that's true. But, like, my yeah. cool weapon, I could have gotten. I probably wouldn't have, but, like, I think she would find that at some point and be like, whoa, what's that? This is a really interesting thing. Because on one, of the things, <laughs> one of the things I think about a lot as a GM is I don't want to punish you for making a really <laughs> awesome choice in the moment to use that wish. Like you group chose it because you all collaborated on that. Mm -hmm. So by group choosing it, you really made an audacious choice. And I don't want to punish that by taking away what you have. I don't want to take away your levels. I don't want to do that. So it's an interesting place mechanically, but then in terms of story, what might have happened if I didn't take those away and you just discovered them about your places and had all these questions. Um, 
it would have been a little bit different if, say, one of you had retained your memories, but the roles <laughs> had Sticky Peak be <laughs> the only one who retained anything. Who's so funny. very, very confused, by the way. <laughs> he was about to die to the Modron before this wish happened. Wow. Yeah, I am curious about that. So he was hiding on the on the floating island or in the floating city. And then like what? Like was he trying to escape? Was he just gonna like wait for reinforcements? What was what was his plan? <laughs> <laughs> so I left him there as a placeholder. I he Sticky Beaks stealth rolls are stupid. You know, like your charisma rolls were stupid and, and Seraphina's intelligence rolls were stupid. Sneaky <laughs> Beak had a dumb level of sneakiness. Uh -huh. And Sneaky there isn't any way anything was ever seeing him. Um, I kind of built him that way originally. And then as we went through the campaign and I kind of leveled him to keep him with you, um, he was over leveled to you all initially. And then as you started in inching up into the seven, eight, nines, I started bumping him up with you. Um, oh, no. So he wasn't going to have any problem sneaking around. And I thought, okay, I can have him be, if they decide that they're going to go and try to knock out the Modron, if that's the angle they're going to take. Um, Cause that's a more obvious threat. If they have like some plan or they're going to go recruit uh, some mage or ascended person to go and banish the city or something like that, like whatever creative thing you all came up with, I can get you an in because you have somebody embedded on the other side. Mm. And the unfortunate thing with the slow evolution of the modern city was that I did not have it well planned out. It just kept filling in some gaps story-wise and it kept giving me an opportunity to push you all to get back on task. What? Um, Us? Never. I was also trying to use the newsies to do that, but <laughs> I couldn't always be very successful, you know. I mean, hard. I, I feel like that was definitely those moments where we would be like, oh yeah, well, shit, whoops. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the end of the day, we did just basically let the city burn and then yeah. fixed it. I mean, but... that's, that's what you chose to do, but then you had I this like was... spell. I feel like that was the uh, result of not going after the slutty into the hole, right? In the orphanage. Yeah. 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 If you had followed the slutty down further in the modern, um, that would have been either a choice to finish off the slutty through and, and save the Craigside crowds and then have the opportunity to either negotiate with or um, fight the modern or rather the city to fight the modern. Um, but because you all just exited the orphanage. I mean, I was on fumes. I don't know about anybody else. Yeah, I was at like half health, no spells. <laughs> like, I was fine because I did nothing. <laughs> I that's was where pushing bench. and having all <laughs> the group the working together is important. <laughs> I mean, We should have sent Jess like, down the hole by herself. Like, go, yeah. go kill them. <laughs> go down this weird cave hole. Oh. Take my map. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that it's kind of like the nature of the game is mechanically yeah. you've spent these things. Yeah. What do you do it's when you're down to your dregs? And that's honestly where some of the most magical roles might happen. It's also where a TPK might happen. Mm -hmm. And TPKs are you fun. You might say it's a roll of the dice. I was fully prepared for Gus to die. I'm just saying. You all had a TPK of sorts. It, if you want to think about the wish spell as a reset, mm. that was a little bit of a total party kill. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, Listen, I still think one of my favorite moments, although at the moment we were probably all like, God damn it, uh, <laughs> is the fact that we climbed up Sticky Beat's toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Instead so of just moving the rock. So I had a map and I'm like, <laughs> I had this map and I was like, I knew where everything laid and 
in my head, I thought, oh, if they go down through the, the right side, they'll hear Sticky be off, Sticky be yelling for them. If that had been your first choice rather than going to the left where the rat kingdom was. Oh, if you had gone to the right, you would have gone past and you would have seen this pile of bird feces and that would have clued you in and you could have yelled up and then he would say, well, help me clear the rocks. I can't do it. Whatever. Anything that could have happened in that zone. But instead... <laughs> I mean, we looked down and we, and it looked like a dead end. So. <laughs> Instead, you crawled That's out of the pooper. Part. It was great. I love it. It was a flew. great. It's a great story. And, and then Sticky Big tried to fire us after we went through all the trouble to climb up his toilet. Yeah. <laughs> so rude. Well, Son of a bitch. That was actually spawned a little bit from things I had been dealing with in my work life right then is like getting people to communicate because people weren't sharing what their updates and so like how am i supposed to let their other people know what's happening and do things to support them and one of the things that i was saying there i was like you know what if i kept getting reports of all these bad things happening and was starting to and was a wise investigator and was sitting there going like oh shit I think that might be my people. And then to find out what was my people, be like, mm. how am I supposed head. to get through my, I've made promises now. Gee. So it was a little fun a, moment. It was a fair reaction, but also like, I know earlier Jason said, we aren't, we weren't really motor ho mor murder hobos. <laughs> we kind of were in the beginning. We didn't murder hobo those guys, they attacked us. That's murder hobo is just like we were always attacked first. And their stuff. That's murder hobo. I, that's true, but like a, tried to tell Sticky Beak that apparently. That's what I kept <laughs> trying to say. It was all self defense. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't good enough. <laughs> so Aww. we're at a section of our outline where I wanted to ask if you had any questions for me or each other. Um, things that you. I mean, you've asked me as we've gone, so I don't need to ask me that many, maybe. Maybe you've answered all the questions you have. But if you have questions for each other about, like, character interactions or um, any, like, metagaming experiences, they're just like, oh, yeah, that was a moment. Or things that you asked me in chat. Some of you asked me things in chat quietly that I never answered. Um, or even, like, NPCs. Anything about NPCs? Thoughts on favorites? I have a question, Larissa. Will you marry me? <laughs> You're if saying you I never know, answered you? If you don't know, uh, we're already married. That's why that's funny to me. But anyway, um, <laughs> no, Rurik, I, I actually asked Rurik the other day about the, uh, I completely forgot. This is one of the things Larissa was talking about. I was editing and we did the thing in the orphanage with the fight and uh, we looted five gems out of those slotty. No idea what they're for, what they do. Um, so I was like, oh, shit, we're never going to know now. What do they do? And then Rurik wouldn't tell me. So Rurik, what do the gems do? So I found a bit of D&D &D lore on um, DM Academy. And the whole thing is these gems can be used to control Sloth. Mm. And what I was thinking was is if you tried to evaluate them or anything like that, you would have realized that something somebody is controlling the slot and you could have used that to right lure from. the modern away maybe or you know there was a lot of different takes with that that you could have done but i was trying to like set up a situation where you could use some of the subterfuge if you wanted to knowing that gems allowed control of the slutty um you could be engaged in some dangerous you know what is it mouse and Cat, cat sort of cat mouse shenanigans, yeah. cat mouse sh shenanigans and what get the modern city could, to float I could, away at any time gus can build his own slot army that too he could um, have so yeah it was it was this whole thing of like you would be able to control some slot or figure out that the person that was doing that and then like unravel the whole thing because maybe by figuring out who they were and putting them out, they would have lost control of some spell or something like that, and it would have unraveled everything. Just like, I tried not to fix it too much, 
but because I had run across this concept that the gems contained the life force of the slods and was useful for controlling them, I was like, oh, here's a gift I can give them if they investigate it, they can find something out. Uh, and you never looked at them again. We got distracted by the fact that Seraphina that we had to was adopt turning into a robot. Children. Well, that and then Seraphina was turning into a robot. No biggie. I mean, Jess did say she was cool with being games. partly robotic. I did. Yes. Rick asked, yeah. like, if if I were to be cured, would I want anything? And I was like, heck yeah. I was like, robotic arms, maybe some, like, metal horns. I think that'd be cool. <laughs> well, tink -tink. That's something I really, really <laughs> like. Just, just, wanted, like, just a metal fingertips, around. just so that you can go this is an area that I definitely encourage other GMs, DMs to pay attention to. If you are going to inflict something on your player characters that might change their beautiful, wonderful, magical paper doll creation, this is their child. This is their imaginary child that they have created. They love it. And if you do something that's going to significantly and permanently change that character, you better verify first. Mm -hmm. I have seen many players leave a campaign because the GM did something unilaterally to their character that was not reversible. Mm -hmm. Or that really went against something that's at the heart of what they believe in or feel. So like having a temporary situation and you're slowly becoming robotic. <laughs> oh no, it's dangerous. It's scary. That's fine. Your brother is dead. That's not to your character. So your story and your family it's like, ah, ah, that's horrifying. <laughs> but there's things in D D that can fix that. There are resurrection spells of different types, and there's other ways of fixing these th things. If you're gonna try to create a permanent character change, <laughs> verify it with your players first. That's great advice. I don't always remember that for some things, but I definitely view it as really important. Um, unless it's reversible, because then somebody can. Like if Jason said to me, oh, I'm really uncomfortable with having rainbow uh, uh, spells. It makes me feel <laughs> with having rainbows coming out of my ass. <laughs> I invented Which I think was spells. actually Jason's idea. Yeah, it was. But if it was something he was really uncomfortable with, then we can change it. We can both retcon and or just say, well, that's curable. Your character just needs to talk with their patron. How cool would that have been? Trying to get to the Feywild at that point. Oh, God. Can you imagine? Oh, oh God. It would be hilarious. It made more sense, I hope, uh, after after we found out that my patron was like an Archfey Leprechaun. That, uh, uh, that's why all of his spells are rainbow. <laughs> I don't know if you guys made that connection or not. I was going to... Uh, there was a spell you had. I can't remember which one it was. But you never got a chance to use it. And I was going to have it spawn a... Uh, uh, pot of gold. A pot of gold. <laughs> that um, would have been incredible. There, you were always short of cash as a group. Mm. And I was trying to find plausible ways to give you some cash. And then sometimes I would have the idea, but you move too quickly through something. I'd be like, Sticky Beak wants to give you money, but you're already headed off to solve the world's issues. Good job. Um, <laughs> Good for you. Like Good this choice. is something that this is like a little metagamey of all of us, I think, because we uh, we tend to be like all trying to pay for things and not wanting to take money from anyone for things in real life. Like if we go to dinner, like we're always for the check, whatever. But like. So I feel like we get in these situations where someone's trying to pay for a quest and we're like, no, well, the right thing to do would be that I did the right thing by doing this quest. You should just have it. Keep the money. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, oh, you're a, you're a poor fisherman. Like, you don't have money to give us a quest reward. You should keep your stuff. And we'll just keep our shitty armor and weapons. And we don't need your grandpa's legendary sword. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, I feel like we, we shoot ourselves in the feet a lot and it's just like our real personalities coming through trying to like do the right thing all the time and like not take the take things from other people. Yeah. Yes, I, I think so. Definitely I definitely have seen that in you all. And there's been a few times where I was like Damn it. Like you're you're negotiating with somebody, like get 
get aggressive. Like we could have got way more than 10% of that mushroom business. I'm just saying. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, honestly, you could have just gotten the money up front that you got and just set 50% and like really demanded a lot of this person and made them work hard in the short term and probably started getting a return on investment. Instead, you were very kind and like, yeah, go figure it out. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. I, just didn't, I don't want to have to worry about it. Ah, I, I'm interested to, if it's, if it's okay, I keep like kind of derailing, but I, there, I guess there is like a, a question that I would be interested on everybody's opinion, but you might have to think about it for a little bit is what is one mechanic that you love in, I guess, D and D specifically and one mechanic that you hate. So I'm trying to think of like good examples, whether it's like action economy or I don't know, spell rules or speed walking speed or something i don't know is that a start silly question i already know the answer to both of these <laughs> yeah you start because you'll give us ideas y'all think about it for a hot minute my answer is my... whatever Burke says <laughs> Bullshit. you can't take mine you can use it as inspiration but you can't take it for inspiration <laughs> um the spell components vocal somatic and material they are such cool features that if you dig in just a tiny bit to utilize them, super fun. That knock makes a loud knocking noise that you can't pull off um, unless you have a focus or something. And, but like there are certain things that cost you money to cast the spell. These set up so many fun opportunities for someone to really like invest in what does it mean for your character to have to go find the gilded cup of Gilderoy in order to summon your familiar F familiar not familiar whatever <laughs> my sommelier I mean, this was my sommelier. Sommelier. now, that, now I, have... I need to have a familiar that's a sommelier and it's my sommelier that's a, <laughs> yes and then the well, one I have summoned Faye and I never did it because I didn't have the I couldn't afford the stuff the whole time because we were broke the whole time. Like Sticky Beak right at the end there gave me the stuff, but I never had a chance to use it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That okay. would have been super awesome. And then the one that I hate, absolutely hate, I don't like trying to track it, is Opportunity Attack. Oh, no, no. Wait. Okay. In the game that I run, I hate Opportunity Attacks. Okay. Trying to track those is a pain in the ass. Every monster has a different range. Um, and then like I give you false consonants because you, especially we do theater of the mind a lot. You move 10 feet out and you think you're safe, but it's still within their range. So they can't yeah. do the opportunity attack yet, but you think you're safe and that they didn't do it. And that I'm, or that I'm forgetting that part of the action economy. Um, in general, the thing I hate in D and D is encumbrance. Mm. Ugh, it yeah. makes sense when somebody's doing something stupid overweight but if you're still being reasonable I'm like yeah we have this stuff so that's why i'm like really liberal with some sort of, bag of holding. holding early on like i'm not gonna waste time on this it's too much work somebody in the party ha needs a bag of holding and if we want more we want more i don't care because i don't want to have to count how many ration packs you've stacked up you have 60 rations great <laughs> you got like four thousand arrows. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck not po not uh, poking yourself in the ass. Yeah, I, I, but I also like the realism because, like, if somebody's going around saying like, and then, and I I do get sticky about this. It's like I'm going to put the whole library in my backpack. And I'm like, <laughs> Asher, <laughs> I'm going to carry three people on my broom. Uh huh. That stuff, the stuff. Oh, the that, library was like, Gus. That was in the temple. That was Gus. That, the, no, I know. Gus did a, that, but Asher was the first time I've encountered somebody try to take an entire library of books, which I think we were in, a, like one of the earlier dungeons when uh, Jess was taking a hiatus for a little bit because she had the other things. I also don't life. remember that, but it sounds like something. Oh yeah, yeah. The when we killed the guy outside of Fisherton, the scientist. Yeah, that's what it was. 
I just remember there being like, oh, there's, this is going to drive me crazy. Where's, oh, but we're doing an emerging campaign, so there's not really a bag of holding yet. No, how can I force then, a bag of holding into being? And then Mrs. M adopted all the books for me. Yeah. Oh, Mrs. Uh, M, because we could never actually remember her name. <laughs> Love it. I didn't I remember no it towards the end. I, I found it in my notes, and I, now I don't remember again. <laughs> I have it in my notes when I first wrote the character up. Oh, I can't find the note. I think I must have thrown it away. <laughs> that was back when I was using sticky notes for everything. If you really uh, want that, I can go find the journal, but it doesn't yeah, seem relevant right now. <laughs> not that relevant. All right. So what about you all? Who wants to go next? I'm still thinking. I call bullshit at Warlocks and I get two spell slots. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's rough, but it, it, it is hard. I mean, like Eldritch Blast is a great spell, but it's not. I did find I, I found myself very frustrated, like almost every encounter, because I was immediately out of spells. Like it. The cool thing with a warlock, and I think this takes significant planning. Is like, yeah, yeah, you're living on. Um, your like spell it's great slot. that. You it's great that you can like get them back in a short rest, but also like a short rest doesn't do me any good in the middle of a fight when I've gone more than two rounds and now I don't have any spells. I don't know. I think that there's definitely the frustration of you only have the two slots, but you're always at the highest level you can cast. All spells are always cast that way. And then you have all the invocations. That's just free spells. Yeah. Um, the problem is, is if you don't have the right ones set up or the ones that fit the situation, it's really difficult. I think that's why I've always gravitated towards wizards or um, I like bards, but they're stuck with the spells they have usually or um, clerics or druids. Unless Those are my twist favorite them in half and rip them apart like Asher and then put a bunch of spells in and then put them back together. That's what I did. Yeah. I took a lot of really weird an... feats to make Asher do a lot of really weird things. <laughs> I just like taking a nap and then being able to redo my spells based on what I think is coming for the day. So knowing that, you know, with, with the Dawn, the Druid is going to be able to rearrange their spells. Super fun. Wizard spending some time studying. I think it'd be really cool to have a wizard and a warlock hanging out together because the wizard during that short rest can work on sorting things out depending on their build and, and the, the subclass. And the warlock can just refresh those. So. It's, it becomes a group that's like very conscientious about every day we're going to take our two short rests because that's it's the meta level of the action economy. Mm -hmm. So what's one thing you like then, Jason? I like that Rurik doesn't make us um, like this is a homebrew thing, but Rurik doesn't make us spend action economy to say things to each other. Yeah, I really like that. Look, I, I don't ever want to be in a situation where I have to choose between casting a fireball and saying, hey, look out, I'm going to cast a fireball and then, like wait a whole nother turn to cast. You're like, which mm -hmm. I think some DMs are like really hardcore about. So um, I do like the like the freedom of the free actions that you give us for conversational purposes and role playing purposes. I don't. I feel like saying stuff is part of the storytelling and I'm not a huge, you all know this, I'm not a huge fan of combat because it doesn't always, it doesn't always make sense. But being able to shout in the midst of combat while you're casting the spell and throw a potion into somebody's hand, that's fun. That's exciting. That gives energy to the combat that mm -hmm. becomes storytelling. But if all you're doing is saying, listing your three things that you're doing, it kind of dampens the fun for me. So I yeah. like it when you all get excited about that. Um, I get, oh, me? Jess, you want to go? I'm having a really hard time of thinking of things. I, I, I really love um, the fact that that you can only use 25 words for <laughs> sending. 
<laughs> we're just like... <laughs> Every one of us now, we're all... Yep. Yeah. I just think it's I so mean, fun. I mean, I feel like... I think Flora <laughs> Bailey in Critical Role really made that a fun thing with Jester. Yeah. And seeing that mm -hmm. way of doing it is hilarious because she wants to use every single word. Yeah. Do, 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 I, do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah. I like that it kind of constrains what you're saying. That's solid. But I'm not terribly worried about going slightly over. And I don't feel like you have to do the whole set of words. But when somebody like traps themselves and they need to do all 25 words, it is hilarious to watch. Yeah. Um, and I guess I don't like... The, the, the walking speed gets me sometimes. Because it's like... I feel like it's always just never quite <laughs> Yeah. Like, if you like, think, oh. think about it, like, logically, like, 30 feet is not very far for six full seconds. Like, I don't know. I feel like I could, I'm, like, a disabled veteran person, and I'm pretty sure I could still run more than 30 feet in six seconds if I really needed to. I don't know. Maybe I'm just, like, not properly imagining how far 30 feet is in my head, but I'm almost sure that it doesn't add up. It's 10 meters, so... I'm what is that in yards? <laughs> I'm thinking of a football field. Same-ish, close enough. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm feet, so it's yeah, ten generally yards. guessing that it's. I'm not specific on the meters, but it doesn't take six seconds to get a first down. How's that? Yeah. Yeah, I think that the interesting part for me is that you're doing a magic action something. You're doing something physical. Yeah. Plus, you're doing. I suppose yeah, because like it's quickie. all of it together. You're seconds, not like yeah. eat, eat, and so, eat. Yeah. so yeah. So I'm thinking about it, and I like I love the concept of just there's probably somebody who's already done this, like of somebody going and practicing, like I'm gonna swing my sword three times like a fighter, or I'm gonna shoot my arrow three times like a ranger, while running across the field, and chugging a small vial of something as if it's a potion of healing. And just see what I actually accomplish and how long it takes me to do that. Yeah. Um, somebody physically fit, so not me. Um, I'm working at getting physically fit, but. Um, Sorry, yeah. y'all. <laughs> I think about working about getting physically fit a lot. Whether I'm working at it, I don't know. <laughs> There's a it name for that stage. I should remember what it's called. The depression. Pre Pre-contemplation <laughs> stage. That's what that's called. Look at that. Mm. Hey! Our still trainer right here. <laughs> Pre so those are mine. I guess. Yeah, pre-contemplation. It's like you're thinking about... Thinking about... <laughs> starting. Yeah. Um, I guess for me something that i struggle with which i think has become apparent in both both of the campaigns is maintenance mechanics so uh, you hate that you do <laughs> you just so things that, so things that require upkeep things that require like feeding an earworm so it doesn't eat your brain eating an earworm so it doesn't eat your brain i mean that one like if it was just feeding the earworm i probably wouldn't be as so like like i wouldn't have been opposed to using it right away but like the fact that like the threat of it eating my brain if i forgot to feed it i was just like well then i'm not gonna take that risk <laughs> I, <laughs> you know like just <laughs> I so enjoyed oh. that whole sequence of things with you all. And I felt bad afterwards <laughs> because I saw how like freaked out you were. But part of my brain was like, but this is so good. <laughs> I can't not. The way Loris is reacting. And I fully expected you to PM me and be like, dude, you got to get rid of the earworms. I can't handle it. <laughs> but you never did. So I was like, okay, nope. she's handling it. Oh, my I just didn't use it. I just... <laughs> La la la, it's not here, out of sight, out of mind. 
I just want to add before you continue the fact that one of my mechanics for Serafina, let me give you the proper terminology. Uh, <laughs> one of my, th nope, not that. One of my things, I swear it's, it's on topic. We was you. that, what was it called? Uh, features? <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> Am I gonna be able to find it? I don't know if I'm gonna be able to find it. It's called Ooh. Fuck Around and Find Out. Basically, as a tinkerer, I got options of things, and one of the options I chose was that I can make essentially like on command a list of items and at the very beginning before we started I had chosen sending stones did I ever pull them out no nope <laughs> and then we got these fucking worms and I was like I should have pulled these out already but now we have these weird worms I feel like this is awkward <laughs> I never touched them <laughs> Well, we also had that one, I think, from Gr from Mrs. Brand. No. Yeah. Yeah, because she rebranded. Yep. <laughs> yep, and we never told her anything. By the way, we yep, solved no. your husband's murder. Have there wasn't nice time. Ah. Um, Wait. So does that mean Grand is alive? alive? Yeah, because your wish was specifically the slutty never found the plane mm -hmm. that's so why i said never, you, not never came never found yes you rewound everything so the canary never dies i knew that Yay. one um sticky beak so like i imagine this poor character of sticky beak who remembers everything right <laughs> yeah. we intentionally left him He's... out so he wouldn't remember like the love of his life dying like that's why we left him out then he fucking remembered anyway <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't there for the wish spell, so he doesn't even realize why he knows. He's like, oh, no. just imagine, you just groundhog dayed this person. Uh, They're sitting there like, the hell, everything's yeah, back to... And then they, like, Wait. they're having a little deja vu, but it's the wrong deja vu, because nobody's coming and telling him that his girlfriend was killed at the theater. Nobody's coming and saying, oh, you can't do that because Grand died. So he's got like two non things happening. He's like, so what does he do then? Well, he's going to run to the theater to go see, make sure his girlfriend didn't die. So he's at the theater and she's about to perform. So he watches the performance and it's like having a, an emotional moment with her. And I'm sitting there like mapping out how much time it's going to take. The whole time. And by like, the time you all got together. Gun, like, waiting for her to die on stage so he can like stop it. Like a hundred percent because he knows how it happened. Right. And so like he's fully invested like i can just imagine like he reveals the gambling den that's going on and all all the other stuff he's like expose is happening he's <laughs> checking back at his public office to make sure that nobody's come to tell him the grand died and he's confused as all get out oh poor birdie and he's out of stupid paper because <laughs> he's been <laughs> up on the modern <laughs> so he can't send messages to his three investigators comes hunting you all in the spaces and places he knows you all are in so in my head i was like well he would first go to gus because he knows you were all at gus's and you kind of had an encampment situation he knew that was a touch base it's just an empty cabin quietly in the woods nobody's there okay second where does he go well he knows where seraphina's brother has his office Go check out that. Nobody's there. Because Serafina's brother is where? With Serafina. <laughs> so I'm just imagining this dude tearing around the city, freaking out, looking up at the sky every five seconds just to check to see if there's an incoming city. <laughs> and he finally arrives at all y'all, hanging out at the bar with Celia, having a nice chat, and reading these letters and being very confused. And I'm like, hey, man, it's been a few years. What you doing? <laughs> That was one of my favorite ways to just see. I didn't even think I should have him come in, but I couldn't resist. Uh, no, that was so good. Uh, 
I guess and a factor that I or a mechanic that I like are um uh passives. I think mm. those are You you do those you picked good ones cuz you do <laughs> cuz you're like well, well my passive what about my passive? Yeah. <laughs> and her- I try to yeah. bargain a lot with my passive. Um, uh, you know, but... the passive wisdom you could use. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or it's just like, and. <laughs> you know, my passive charisma is 96. <laughs> you know, the, I probably wasn't very fair to you, especially if you like that mechanic a lot, Larissa, because I often just used your passives for your win. There were a lot of interactions, both you and Gus had Alua and Gus had with characters. I was like, yeah, here's the information. Because your lowest passive ratio for charismas and deceptions and performance checks were so high. I was like, yep, here's the info. <laughs> so I didn't always tell you when you had passed a passive. Ah. But knowing that you like that now. Oh no. <laughs> we will utilize just- that. I think, well, I think it's, I think it's a cool mechanic because I think it gives an opportunity for people to really like to sit in their character a little Uh. bit more rather than having to worry about rolling. It's just like to naturally know, it's kind of like when you take a feat and you're like, well, I would, I should definitely know this because of this, but like, so that you can, you, you can have a little bit more confidence uh, in situations. It could, could end up being like a fault. You know, you could yeah. be over, and then it could result in overconfidence, which could also create some fun moments. Um, yeah, so I just, I, I think it's a fun mechanic that doesn't always necessarily get, uh, and this is not feedback in this particular case. I'm just saying in general, in with with people that I played uh, uh, games with, just being, it's not often used. I think mm. often touched on, but of the people that I played with, I think where you use it. Uh, or let us use it more often than not. So yeah. Well, I think that passives are super useful. Honestly, they're a time-saving mechanic too. Um, it, I think I could be more transparent about when they've been successful because it just highlights how good your character is at things, like where they're awesome. And so, <laughs> like, you should be able to show that off. Um, Jess, what is what is Seraphina's passive perception? Perception. Uh-huh. I'm just curious. Passive. Oh, my my passive investigation is the best. So passive perception 16. What's your investigation? <laughs> 23. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> and this gets to the thing I said earlier. The character who never investigated and should have always been <laughs> investigating. There wasn't... Whenever <laughs> Jess, whenever Jess said, "I'm looking at this thing," I was like, "Are you like looking, or are you just like looking?" So I was trying to decide if she was perceptioning or investigating. Investigating. If she was investigating, I might have her roll, but half the time I was sitting there going, "Like she's not going to need to roll for this." I mean, the <laughs> other issue is that, like, when Jess or where Seraphine, I guess specifically, was investigating things, it was like she stuck her hand in a. <laughs> in something and like would have died if she didn't have some sort of stone skin feature ah, that so. was the coolest thing and I, Jessica was so sad that I lost my sparkle <laughs> you could have been a sparkly robot at the end if you just held oh it oh my up. god <laughs> so oh no. I knew that you were going to have that wish spell come up and I was actually trying to cause you a dilemma as a as a player because me yeah i was targeting you just hardcore with that wish spell <laughs> because i had just shared like a session or two before that the only way to save somebody from the full slotty infection is a wish mm-hmm. and you got this brother out there who's now dead and like i was really hoping that you'd have that as like oh i'll use the wish spell for that or now I've got an issue where this mechanical crawly thing is happening. I could do something to stop that. And you all went big level. Did you did you expect us to use the wish in that way when you 
Did you, or did you like ever consider it as a possibility? I just wanted to give you some fun, crazy things that were like, I really enjoyed this group of characters dealing with things beyond their scope. I'm glad you did. Like, no, I'm just kidding. Alua had... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think it frustrated us a couple of times, as in like, uh, we're just not sure. Like that what moment where do. Sir Gregor is like, "Will you decide where?" Like you're the you're on the freaking <laughs> Hollow Council. Tell me where to go, you son of a bitch. You're in charge <laughs> of this city. Oh my god! Don't make me yeah. decide. I'm so tired I've, of this uh, old man. I've very often, as an educator. Uh, my life before been in the position of not being the decider but being asked to make the decision so i find a lot of joy in passing that on to others <laughs> it's like what would you do ah is that you use it on students as well you're like what do you think you should do do you think that was a good choice i'm not going to tell you it was a good or bad choice but do you think it was a good choice Oh. If, Sir, if Sir Gregor would have picked, maybe he wouldn't have died. <laughs> yeah. No. Nah. I think Sir Gregor would have chosen what you had him do. Um, I think that... I'm a little sad I never um, got my Dick Brady showdown. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. You're, you wait, what? You threw it at me a couple times, but it just wasn't convenient to follow it. When it Dick Brady. Yeah. I wasn't really... Not what I heard. Like, there was a lot of things that I threw out... <laughs> from your backstories occasionally that I wasn't always sure that you were picking up on. And I just watched this TikTok the other day. They were saying, we caught all four of your clues. <laughs> and the DM says, yeah, all four of the 12,000 that I threw out to you. <laughs> and I'm never sure when you're just making a choice to avoid something or I'm being too subtle. Always so, assume I have a that brain you're being of a string year old. <laughs> It's usually uh, like Jason will message me and be like, I think this is what is happening. Like he catches on quicker than you and I, Jess. I'm just sitting yeah. there like, okay, wait, what do I have to do next? What do I have to do next? Like, we all got to resurrect you, a meta chat. You, you might need a meta chat. Because <laughs> your characters <laughs> might have picked up on that and you can decide. Like, honestly, metas to me are a useful part of D&D. &D. Mm. This is supposed to be fun. Don't get so trapped in the idea that a meta situation is bad. I think, I mean, this might, I'm proselytizing to people out there who might be like, no, I disagree with that. I think meta is terrible. But to me, meta used wisely and responsibly is a way to make sure you're all having fun. If you right. feel like you keep missing things because you don't catch it, but somebody else in the group does, and they're like, I think your character would have caught this. Let me explain it to you. You can always sit there and discard it. Remember, it's role-playing. You're imagining. Mm -hmm. You can pretend that you definitely didn't catch that. Or you can pretend that you did, and it's okay. I don't know <laughs> shit. Instead of meta, I'm going to start using deus ex machina. I'm just going to have Asher come in as a god and just give the answer to people and then disappear again. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Nice. Well, with that, I think we had a really fun campaign and came to a surprise conclusion. And I loved that. That was hilarious. Yeah, we did approach the end very suddenly. <laughs> kind of happened. Yes, yeah. we did. Like, I kept, J Jason kept asking me, like, how many sessions do you think are left? And I was like, mm, five to seven. Nope, one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish the campaign was over. That's basically oh, what happened. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, we could have continued, but I think that this was such a super fun and exciting way to conclude that it was worth it. I mean, totally it was a real cliffhanger it. because we weren't even sure if that was the end. So yeah. you got us. We were like, yeah, I we wasn't like, Wait, sure. what? what? I rolled and I went like, okay. And it could have been a bad situation. It could have been a flub. You know, life happens. I'm just, and that's I was okay. so sure Gus was going to die from the wish spell. I thought it was going to kill him. He wasn't going to make it to the other side. It was a high probability. Well, Serafina was so sure it was going to work that her letters were two sentences long, being like, I think it's going to work. Here we go, guys. <laughs> oh, my God. Y'all cracked me up. So, Jason, we, so yes. something for the audience. I asked everybody to write a letter to the other two characters, and we were I was using that to help build the um, table I had for the roles. 
um, and the roles were going to like result in what happened. And so I was using a lot of information from those letters to kind of put things together and some mechanics from the world and just like create a fun list. Um, and then I'm reading Jason's and Jason has these heartfelt deep letters that were like three, oh, beautiful. four paragraphs long. <laughs> Larissa sends me, I think it was like two paragraphs for each of them. Decent, solid. And just like, I believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> and it cracked me up she so hardcore. So confident. She was like, I don't know, it's going to be perfect. <laughs> the best, the best part is I think either the day before or two days before we recorded this episode where the, like, and, and Rurik was like, Hey, you could really use those letter guy letters, guys. Not like, <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And Jason's like, I don't really know what we're supposed to be doing with these letters. Write the whole fucking thing. Like, ugh. show off. I loved it. I, I loved that. Like, Jess, I think typically in our interactions, you've been like the last to send things in because you like yeah. hold on for too long. Yeah. And this one, you were like on it. You just did it. You had it done. I was like, mm, dang. I'm telling you, she knew. She was, she was like, this is going to work. This is great. I'll <laughs> see y'all in a bit. <laughs> All I know is, thankfully, I have six figures of student loan debt. And it allows me now to write quick letters quickly that are pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think my six figures of student loan debt allows me to be a really good curriculum writer and a really good scenario writer. <laughs> I can put, I I can really put context like into you're... place. I don't want to be direct, but I can put context into place. So, honestly, like I work enough now that this is my creative outlet. So all of my creative writing degree gets funneled into this. That's where all my creativity goes. It's <laughs> backstory. Yeah, there are worse things. Yeah. Well, we're wrapping up this session. This is a little long. Anybody who stayed with us for the whole thing, we really appreciate you for that. Um, we are going to be doing a series of one shots for a while, and we're going to move to an every other week schedule um, after this session. Um, and we will announce if we are going to do another campaign or not. But what I would love to invite you all to do is reach out if you know how to contact us. You can see the things up on the screen right now. Um, I'm normally the jerk who says, you can't have my pod, but this trio of ne'er-do-wells has convinced me that it's okay to share the pod with you all. If you would like to join us for a session, reach out. We're going to do a whole bunch of one-shots, inviting people. We're going to invite our friends. We're going to drag family in occasionally. And if you're interested in joining us, please connect. We'll try to get things on a schedule. The most fun thing about D&D is that it's impossible to get schedules together, but we'll get you in. We'll do a couple sessions of, of fun and frivolity for a couple of months before we make better decisions or worse decisions. Mm -hmm. Who knows? It's the holidays. So, We're taking and a honest, break. Yeah. And honestly, like if you've, I think I would love to make sure that we get, like if you, if you've never been had the chance to play D&D you don't know how to start play D playing D&D &D. you don't know how to connect with your group like I think we could be a good opportunity for you to try it out because that's that's literally how we met was we all just took a chance uh on a random group making event for D&D &D, uh and two of us there we go two of us hadn't played before mm. and then yeah and then this one had vaguely played but hadn't played in years and so like it just like come play with us yeah, yeah. Come play with us become a, so <laughs> become a podling become a pod is that really what we're gonna go with i like podlets it. podlings podlets i like podling i like podlings Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful Thank time. You, Find your pod or join ours. Bye. You never know. Okay, okay goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.